good to see all of you. Thanks for coming out here tonight. I'm sorry for the rescheduling. I'll tell you the story. Hang on, let me get this out of there. Get all this stuff. So we are all good at something. You can probably think of your own superpower. Apparently mine is catching COVID. And so I had COVID August 1st uh, for the third confirmed time, fifth suspected time. So I think I'm not contagious. I think I'm passing out of symptoms. Uh, you might want to keep your distance anyway. So I, I had a speech that morning in San Antonio and then this that night, and I converted the morning one to virtual, then the night one. We're like, well, let's just reschedule. So I appreciate you coming out despite all that. Uh, so as you heard, my name is Michael Weber. And if you Google Michael Weber and COVID, an article will come up from April 2020, because one of the fun facts about me is I was one of the very first people in the world to get COVID, uh, which is because I'm very good at it, as you heard. I had COVID in January 2020 before the first official case in the United States, which was around the end of January. I traveled a lot, and I was in Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show, so I went to Vegas and got a disease, is what I like to tell people, and that's always funny. The Consumer Electronics Show is like 80,000 people from 120 countries, something like that, and I think I shook hands with 4,000 people, and I went to many booths from China, from the Wuhan province, and other things, and I was there because at the time I was working for a company called NG, you might have heard of. NG is this massive, sprawling, global French energy company, and I was their chief science and technology officer, so I was the person in charge, the C-level executive in charge of research and innovation. So I had a sprawling empire of research labs in Belgium and France and Singapore and Chile all reporting to me. And I went with one of the other executives to the Consumer Electronics Show just to get a feel for the innovations going on. And the Consumer Electronics Show is so large, you have to hire like expert chaperones to take you around and you pre-organize all your meetings. So we had all these meetings and we had these two chaperones, and one was really sick and coughing the whole time. He's like, but don't worry, I'm not going to you know, let you guys down. I'm going to take you around anyway. Uh, and then probably I got COVID from him. It's hard to say, but I appreciate him working hard. And then I tweeted out from the Las Vegas airport a couple of days later. My boss ended up being sick. And I was at the Las Vegas airport, and I tweeted out, everyone around me is coughing and sneezing. It's like an infirmary. If I don't get sick, then I'm like a superman. And that was uh, January 11th. Flew back to Paris, landed January 12th, and I was deathly ill for five days. And, and I tweeted out while I was like, like, I think I've got that zombie virus that's just now in the headlines. And this becomes part of the story because I ended up getting better. My wife got it. My son got it. Everyone's fine. It's okay. No long COVID as far as we know. So there's a happy ending to that. But then flash forward a few months to April 2020, some enterprising journalist found my tweet. And she was working on a theory that the Consumer Electronics Show was a super spreader event as the last really big global event. There was that one biotech conference in Boston in late February or whatever it was, but the Consumer Electronics Show might have been the big one. And then she found my tweet and she's like, would you be willing to get an antibody test, which you couldn't just buy then. You had to go to a special clinic and all that stuff. I was like, yeah. And I tested positive for the antibodies in April 2020, so I had COVID. And this is very interesting. So if you read the story, this is the thing for which I'm most famous. I always wished it would be for my energy expertise or you know, my tennis skills or something like that, but it's for catching COVID before other people. And uh, just another fun fact, it was kind of interesting, is we call it COVID-19 for a reason, which is it was identified in 2019. Like it really took off in our mindset in 2020, but it was circulating and known as early as November 2019. That's when President Trump was briefed on it, for example. And this journalist, she was thinking and working on a theory that it was circulating in Las Vegas in November and December 19, because there's so many international travelers and so many conferences in the winter season in Vegas. And they have the Teamsters Union there. And the Teamsters Union is a union in charge of driving trucks, but also setting up and breaking down exhibitions. And the Teamsters Union keeps meticulous records of who calls in sick. And they had a spike in Teamsters Union members in Las Vegas calling in sick in November and December. So they probably passed it on from conference to conference to conference, something like that. So it probably was in Vegas, and then we went there and got it. I don't know what the moral story is, but I haven't been back to Vegas yet. So, uh, okay, so I got it again on August 1st. I'm all better, but that's why we delayed. I appreciate you sort of having us. Uh, I've got all sorts of remarks. I've got no slides. I'm just going to like tell some stories, and then we'll do some Q&A, which hopefully will be very interactive and fun. I do want to talk about this room. How many of you know what the name of this room is, by chance? Anybody know? It's the Shooty Fath Room. That's right. Her picture is back there behind the very tall, handsome gentleman. Uh, her picture, Shooty, was on the Electric Utility Commission from 1977 to 2017 for 40 years. She just died like a year or so ago. At, I can't remember, 105 years old or something like that. And I served with her for five years in the equivalent of this room at the old Austin Energy headquarters. 
for the Electric Utility Commission meetings from 2008 to 2013. I did it for five years, like I can't take it. And she had 40 years of stamina, so I was really impressed. And she's like the perfect public servant. Like she was there, like it's a volunteer gig to be on the commission. The Electric Utility Commission for Austin Energy is a little bit like the Public Utility Commission is for Texas, the EUC is for Austin. It's kind of one way to think about it. More advisory though and less authoritative, but we were there to sort of guide and give input and react to different policy decisions the city utilities making around the power mix or electric vehicles, you name it, rates. So we went through a big rate case in 2012. I raise your rates, you're welcome. I was a part of that process and we did that with Shooty. But the last time they had done it before that was like 18 years, no one can remember. And Shooty's like, let me tell you how the last rate case went down. So a phenomenal woman, really learned a lot from working with her. She had a spectacular memory all the way to the end. She, we'd still like get lunch every once in a while, uh, even after she was 100 and before COVID. So really sad that she's gone, but glad that we had her and that uh, we sort of had a couple of years to work together. Some of you might know where Uncle Billy's used to be. Uh, I can't remember what it is now. The Eastsiders or something, Eastsiders Cafe on Barton Springs. It used to be Good Eats Cafe. Before that, it was her husband's boat shop, just if you're wondering. So there's some of us in the clean energy community that do clean energy events there, sort of tied a little bit to, to shooting that. So I wanna honor and acknowledge her. So it's nice to be in a room named after her after having a chance to collaborate with her. So let's talk about energy. I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I'm really good at COVID, you know that. I worked in France for a little bit. I'm a born and raised native Austinite. And even for the natives, this is hot. This is too hot. I mean, it got to 105 like every once in a while, but not for like 60 days in a row or whatever. And so this is just incredible. And not only am I a native Austinite, like I was here when Austin was weird in the 1970s and now it's like fancy and rich. Like people say like Austin grew up or something. Uh, but I live in my same, my childhood home. So my parents built the home. I was born in 1971 at West Campus, uh, if anyone knows where West Campus is. So there, and we moved into my house in 1972 when I was a year old. And my wife and I bought it from my parents in 2007. And so it's been owned by two Webers, my parents, and now me and my wife. And so I kind of can do compare and contrast. And just so uh, you understand, my house is not that far from Zilker Park, kind of Rollingwood, Westlake area. My backyard when I was a kid backed up to Cedar Chopper land. Does anyone know what a Cedar Chopper is? The local, okay. Cedar choppers lived behind me, and I had nightmares about the cedar choppers like crashing in through the window and killing me with their axes and that kind of. Now, that was like the rural frontier. And in third grade, my little girlfriend, Valerie Lowe, would ride her horse on Bee Caves Road from the county line to my house so we could ride horses around in the woods in the cedar chopper land behind my house. And now Bee Caves is like a five lane highway, right? And so I was rural frontier, and now I'm urban core. So I can talk about old Austin all you want. Uh, but I think that gives a little context. I'm an Austin guy, born and raised. Father was a professor of chemistry at UT for 40 years. I went to UT. I left UT in 95. I was there 89, 95, did six years. My wife and I met in the Longhorn Band, fell in love, got married, moved to California. And I was in California for 11 years for grad school at Stanford in mechanical and electrical engineering, studying combustion, how to burn things. I used to burn shit for a living, as I say, and then measure it with lasers. And then those lasers used to measure the environmental pollution. So I became an environmental guy from doing combustion went to a startup in Southern California, went to a think tank called the Rand Corporation. By then, as 2006, we have three kids, all three born in California. We thought it's time to come home. The reason to come back home to Texas was we spent all our vacations visiting family, and we thought vacation should be used to flee the family. So we moved to Austin, and so we could use vacations to leave. So we came back in 2006. So I was gone. Like, I lived in California. I lived in Texas. I lived in France. I lived in Switzerland as a kid. I lived in Vermont. I lived a few places. And that journey kind of colors who I am. But you already heard a little bit. I'm an engineer primarily. I did some think tank work. I dabble in policy. I've done some entrepreneurship. I worked at a startup. I helped run an incubator. Some of you know someone who's being celebrated tonight in one of the incubators. I worked at a global multinational company. So I've done big corporate, and I'm mostly a professor. So I'm mostly an academic. And I teach energy courses and entrepreneurship. And I got a former student in the room right now, so it's good to see the students here. So, uh, so I'm an energy guy with different views. And ultimately, I come back to the conclusion that energy is good. It's easy to convince ourselves, given all the things going wrong, that energy is bad. In fact, I'd say energy is good. We would like more access to more energy. But there are these trade-offs that energy done the right way makes us really wealthy and powerful and, and safe and secure and healthy and all these kind of things. But energy done the wrong way makes us poor and it makes us sick and it makes us insecure. So it's not that energy is bad. It's more like we got to do energy the right way versus the wrong way. It's inherently about trade-offs. There's no fuel or technology that's all good or all bad. Even the worst ones, coal, I can tell you lots of great things about coal. Even the best ones, I can tell you some downsides about. So it's all about trade-offs and designing the system to maximize the good and minimize the bad. Energy is good. And I would say that it's not just good, it's critical. 
It touches everything we care about. You name the issue, I can give you an energy hook. I know there's cybersecurity here with land, there's healthcare, there's uh, social dynamics, there's socioeconomic, you name it, you name the issue, there's an energy connection. And so energy is not only good, but it touches every part of society we care about. And I would argue even that energy is critical. And I would argue it's the most critical, actually. Fundamentally, resources are more important than anything else. And you don't have to take my word for it. Let me introduce you to a man named Rick Smalley. Anybody know that name, Rick Smalley? I see some people nodding. Yeah, Rick Smalley, beloved, famed professor of chemistry at Rice University who died in 2005, unfortunately. Got the Nobel Prize for discovery of Buckminster Fullerene or the Buckyball, the carbon-60 geodesic dome-shaped carbon molecule that enables materials with really incredible properties or new things you could do with it. It's just kind of a phenomenal structure. And I pay attention to these stories because my dad's a chemist. I don't know what this means, but he seems important. And uh, Smalley got the Nobel Prize in the late 90s, spent the last few years of his life talking about humanity's 10 grand challenges. It is now known as Smalley's List, the 10 grand challenges for society. And he put them in a very particular order. Energy, water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism and war, disease, education, democracy, and population. And he put them in this order for a reason, a logic being that if you could solve one, you could solve the next one. If we could solve energy, we make energy available, secure, affordable, sustainable, reliable, that kind of thing. Then we can solve our water problems. Because if you have energy, you can lift water from a deep well or move it thousands of miles or diesel at the oceans, you name it. If you solve your energy and water problems, you could solve your food problems because you can use that water to irrigate the fields and use that energy to make fertilizers or agrochemicals and pesticides or diesel or the mechanization you need to reap the crops, refrigerate the crops and cook the crops, and then you can have food. And, once, and by the way, that's important because if you go to like Maslow's hierarchy, it starts with food. But I think at a societal level, it's actually energy, then water, then food. Because if you have energy, water, then you have food. And then if you have food, you can protect the environment. It's hard to think about the environment if you're hungry. If you protect the environment, you can lift people out of poverty, which prevents terrorism and war. And then you can turn your attention to disease. And then you can focus on education. By the way, you need energy for education because you need the light bulb to read at night. Or you need uh, the light of the fireplace if you're President Lincoln, as many of you probably studied before. Or you need um, ability to have sanitation so you can go to school, everything else. And then if you have education, that's a precursor to a well-functioning democracy. Although I submit to you we're testing that hypothesis right now in America. Then you get to population. This is important because a lot of environmental groups say start with population. It's like it's on the list. It's number 10. It's at the end of the list. You think about population, it matters. you got to think about resource limits. But if you really want to think about population, you probably know this. The most important way to deal with population is to educate women young girls and early teen girls. Educate women, so education's higher than population. You get education after everything else. So this is Smalley's list, you don't take my word for it, but I agree that energy, water, food at the top, in fact, that's how I've designed my research group at the University of Texas, is the energy, water, food nexus. I kind of came to that independently, I was pleasantly surprised to see it affirmed by this Nobel laureate. So energy is good, it touches every part of society, but I would say it's critical, it's the most critical. The next thing I would say is also kind of magical, like energy's kind of cool. So think about how magic shows up in our popular culture in different places. There are different stories. You probably know the myth of the unicorn. I know this is Austin. When you, when you hear unicorn, you probably think billion dollar startup and I'm a venture capitalist as well. That's not what I mean. I mean the mythical one horn creature. The, the, the myth of the unicorn probably started in the Indus River Valley of Pakistan and is about this creature. And the magic of the unicorn is not that it's rare, although it's rare, I've yet to see one. It's that the horn had the magical ability to rid a stream of water of poison. The magic of the unicorn is it makes water safe to drink, something we use energy for today. We've replaced the magic of the unicorn with energy. We use energy to treat and pump and do that kind of thing with water. Uh, let me talk about Tantalus, the Greek figure Tantalus from mythology. Tantalus misbehaved, and the Greek gods punished Tantalus and gave him eternal thirst and eternal hunger and put him in a a pond of water below a fig tree. And when he'd reach for the fig, the branch would bend out of reach. And when he bent down to get water, the water would recede out of reach. So the water and food were just out of reach. And that's where we get the word tantalize from tantalus, which means food and water just out of reach. Well, what do we do today? We use energy to bring food and water within reach. We use energy to overcome the power of the Greek gods. That's sort of the way I think about it. Uh, let me talk about Mickey Mouse. How many of you have seen Fantasia, the movie Fantasia? Okay, how many of you have not seen Fantasia? I urge you to see Fantasia, one of the few old Disney movies that has held up with time. So, but go see it. So, yeah, for those of you who've seen Fantasia, not 100 years old, maybe 80 years old or so, it is a magical movie because it was a movie that Disney wanted to make that merged music and filmmaking so that when you see images, you hear music. When you hear music, you see images. So, he worked with Leopold Stokowski, the great conductor, on this amazing soundtrack. 
And the more famous scenes is the Sorcerer's Apprentice, the Mickey Mouse dressed up as the Sorcerer's Apprentice for the wizard, for the sorcerer. And the uh, sorcerer gives his apprentice, Mickey Mouse, the chore to go fetch water. And Mickey doesn't want to do it because the water's heavy. Think of like a two and a half gallon bucket. It's like tens of pounds, like 20 pounds, something like that. And so two 20 pound buckets, that's a lot of work. And so Mickey says he'll use magic. So he casts a spell on a broom to carry the water for him. But then mayhem ensues as the brooms break and multiply, and then they have a flood. But the point is, it's such a pain to lift water, a job that is mostly assigned to women and girls around the world, except in rich places, they have electricity. We use electric pumps to lift the water instead of magic. So that's another example. Uh, one more example of magic. So the medieval alchemists, Rumpelstiltskin and others, who could take straw or lead or hair or grass, things that were sort of abundant and cheap, and turn it into gold was sort of the idea of the alchemists. And today we do that in continuous fashion at a modern refinery. We take crude oil, which is worth less per pound than lead, and turn it into gasoline or Chanel number no. five or pharmaceuticals that are worth more than gold per ounce. We're doing that magic transformation, that alchemy with modern chemical engineering in a continuous way. So I kind of think like energy is good, energy is important. It's the most critical thing to society. It's also kind of magical. And if you know Arthur C. Clarke, the sci-fi writer, he would say that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so as a technologist, I think, cool, magic and technology go hand in hand. And that's just context to say, I think energy is worth paying attention to and studying. So I appreciate you being here to talk about it tonight. But let's talk about what's happening, because that's all just set up for energy going through transition. And what does that mean for energy going through transition? It's funny, because transitions are the news for like sexual identity reasons today. And you may be thinking about, well, maybe energy is going through this as well, but this is a different kind of transition and we should be supportive of transitions in general is kind of what I conclude from this, whether it's energy or humans or whatever we're going through. And I would say that the thing about energy that surprised people is that the idea of transition and energy is not new, it is perpetual. Energy is always changing. It's not static and stable. We have these periods of 30 or 40 years where it seems kind of similar for a while but actually has changed many times. We, in fact, we define these eras of change uh, with stamps like the Industrial Revolution or the Second Industrial Revolution or the Space Age. These ages are defined by the changes in energy abilities or energy services or forms of energy we're using and how we convert them. And so energy transition is part of it. And we're going through an energy transition right now. I think we're like a decade into a three-decade transition. That's what it feels like to me. I don't really know exactly but we might even be 15 years into it. We can argue about the start point, but energy is changing right in front of us. Why is it changing? Well, there are six demographic reasons, six demographic trends, three technological reasons changing, all wrapped up in a two-sided challenge. So let me walk you through that. The six demographic trends right now are population growth and economic growth, the most fundamental ones. This is more of a global thing, although we have population and economic growth in Austin as well and in Texas. So population growth and economic growth. Industrialization and urbanization and then electrification and motorization. So there's more of us, we're getting richer, we're moving from farm to factory, from rural area to city, and as we get rich, we want electricity and mobility because electricity and mobility are the desired fuels and services of energy if you're rich. If you're energy poor, you want cow dung, wood, whatever you can get for heating and cooking, the energy needs for the poor, heating and cooking, but as you get richer, you want energy needs to do things like run a factory or make more money or then get comforts of life like air conditioning, information technologies and lighting and other things which are powered by electricity or by mostly liquid fuels for mobility, although that's changing as we speak. And I see your shirts, electric greater than gas. My electric Mustang is right behind us. If we raise the windows, we could see it. It's bright orange, so it's uh, unmistakable. And so those trends are important because if you have population growth and economic growth and urbanization, industrialization and electrification and motorization, it means how much we're consuming is growing where we're consuming it and what we're consuming it for is changing. Everything's changing simultaneously. And so the system has to change. Let's put some numbers on it. If the floor is zero, zero energy per person per year, up to my knees is the global average energy consumption, 75 million BTU, BTU is a British thermal unit of energy, 75 million BTU of energy per person per year is the global average. Up to my hips is a British person consuming twice as much as the global average, about 150 million BTU. Up to my head, is an American. So an American consumes about 300 million BTU, twice as much as the British person, four times as much as the Chinese citizen or the global average. And then maybe you on my shoulders to your head is a Texan, which is sort of fascinating. A Texan consumes 60% more than the average American who consumes twice as much as the average Brit who consumes twice as much as the global citizen. 
that's a factor of eight or something like that, from the average to the Texan. We have a very energy intensive industry. We have a hot climate. We have big houses. We have big cars. We drive our big cars long distances and we air condition our big houses in the hot climate. So we use a lot of energy and we associate that for a variety of cultural and historical reasons with wealth. The more we consume, the richer we get. Although most people in the world think the more you consume, the poorer you get, but we are selling the energy in Texas, so it makes us money. So we have a, a flip view. If you take all the people in the world who would like to live like a Texan, how many of us are in the world? Eight billion? And we're going to grow to, I don't know, 10 billion or 12 billion? If you go to 10 billion and they consume like Texans, we have to multiply the energy system by a factor of 10. We have to produce, move, dispose of, then manage the waste of 10 times as much energy. I don't see that happening very easily because we're already hitting environmental limits at the current level and telling them, sorry, you don't get it, doesn't seem appropriate. Telling us, yeah, you have to give it up, doesn't go very easily. We got to figure this out. So how can we get there? And this is kind of the context for us, these trends. But that's the fundamental driver. There's more of us getting richer. We want to change where and how and what we're using energy for. Overlay these six demographic trends with three technology trends. The first megatrend, these are trends over decades and centuries. Increasing efficiency. Our things are becoming more efficient as time goes on. The light bulb is more efficient, the air conditioner is more efficient. Everything's becoming more efficient with time as we get better at it. This is a good news story. We use less energy per unit of good or service than we used to use. This is a fantastic trend. The second trend is the increasing information intensity of everything, but especially energy. More data, it used to be like sensors, used to be people watching it, now we have data and sensors everywhere. And some ironies there, as data becomes more information, sorry, energy becomes more information intensive, information becomes more energy intensive. So there's some flips there. And as energy goes more distributed, distributed computing becomes more centralized. So they go different directions with the cloud being a centralized computing capability. And then the third trend is increasing decentralization, which is, or maybe, decreasing centralization or increasing customization. I just said the same thing three different ways. We used to have large power plants far away that would send the power to us or large wastewater treatment plants or large refineries. And now we're thinking like small rooftop solar panels or small fuel cells or reciprocating engines or whatever distributed energy. And now we're doing that for other things. It's not just energy, also do it for telemedicine. Why well, go to a hospital? A hospital is a great place to go to get an infection or a surgery but not everyone needs to go to the hospital all the time. So a lot more telemedicine, remote diagnosis, but also manufacturing with desktop 3D printing. Instead of a factory making a million of the same thing, we can now make a million different customized things with our distributed manufacturing. So it's happening there. It's also happening with water with rainwater harvesting and smaller community water treatment plants and that kind of thing. But these three trends of increasing efficiency or decreasing energy intensity, that's the same thing. Increasing information intensity and increasing decentralization are the technology trends that drive this. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So those technology trends are on top of the demographic trends. I hope that's better for you. And I know I'm a fast talker. And I mumble, so sorry about that. But we can come back to any of it during Q&A. Those technology trends are on top of the demographic trends, all wrapped up in a two-sided challenge, which is we have to increase energy access for the billion people who don't have it and decrease impacts for the 7 billion who do. So there's 8 billion of us, about a billion people don't have access to electricity. Another 2 billion don't have access to reliable electricity, at least according to our standards. A billion or so don't have access to treated piped water. A couple billion don't have access to sanitation. There's billions of people without, and it really isn't ethical, moral, philosophical, or appropriate to say sorry, but we also can't keep doing it the way we're doing it now, so we got to figure that out. But that's the two-sided challenge. How do we decrease impacts and increase access within all those trends and everything else? So that it means we have a transition, which is happening right now. And the history of energy is that transitions happen all the time. There tend to be periods where there's faster transition. I already mentioned the Industrial Revolution, and then the second Industrial Revolution, where we switched forms of energy from biomass to coal and from heat to motion. The key invention of the Industrial Revolution is the ability to convert heat to motion with a steam engine, which is hard to do. It's, it's easy to make heat. And we used motion, we would use like flowing air or flowing water to get our motion at our water mills or windmills, that kind of thing. But taking heat to motion was the key enabling invention of the Industrial Revolution. And then later we got internal combustion engines, that kind of thing. And we had the rise of petroleum based cars, gasoline cars, like in the 1930s, rural electrification in the 30s and 60s. So we have these waves, and some of it's based on the asset life. We build a bunch of stuff the last 40 years, and then we have another wave, and that's one reason why we're having a wave right now of coal plants that are about to retire because they're 40 years old and that kind of thing. So we have these punctuated periods of consistent energy transition, and if you look at the fuels, wood was dominant in the United States until 
1885 when coal became number one, oil became number one in 1950. This year, in the United States, I think natural gas will overtake petroleum, which is sort of fascinating. Then natural gas will be dominant for a while. I don't know what will take it next, maybe nuclear or renewables or something else. We'll see how it goes. So these transitions that happen, and we can learn a couple of lessons. One is the transitions take decades. So if we want a transition, we want to go faster, we'll have to try hard to make it go faster. We tend to go towards higher performing things. Coal was better than wood in terms of energy density and cleanliness. Oil is better than coal in terms of energy density and cleanliness. Gas is better than oil in terms of cleanliness and ease of handling. Renewables are better from a cleanliness perspective. The density is different, so we got to sort that out. But nuclear is both more dense and cleaner. So we can think about this trend that we tend to move towards better stuff. And we tend to decarbonize. Wood's more carbon intensive than coal, than oil, than gas, than nuclear renewables. So decarbonization is not an idea that Al Gore forced on us. It's something that's been happening for like 200 years. And in fact, on a relative level, and grams of carbon emitted per unit of energy, but on a total level, the United States have peaked about 15 years ago. We're actually dropping our CO2 emissions despite population growth and economic growth. So is the UK. The UK is doing it on purpose. We're doing it by accident, which is sort of interesting. We can come back and talk about that. And Texas, actually, we're kind of decarbonizing a little bit too, but shh, don't tell anybody. It's embarrassing. We'd rather... You know, we don't want that to be known that we're violating official state policy, that carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is plant food, and therefore we should emit more. That's kind of the Texas status. It's Austin's fault, exactly. So we're doing this transition. These transitions take a while, but we have some lessons from them. I would say within that context, context as an engineer, as an innovator, as someone who thinks about invention, that we could use some energy innovation. I hope some of you have some good ideas because 60% of the modern economy, the global economy, 60% of our primary energy conversions happen on four devices, a steam turbine, a gas turbine, a gasoline engine, and a diesel engine. I'm calling this four devices. I could call them two devices, internal combustion engine and turbines, but four devices are responsible for 60% of the world's primary energy conversion. They were invented as recently as 1893. We're running the global economy on old stuff. The other 40% is like burners and boilers and stoves, which are even older, like Roman times are older, right? So we're running the entire global economy on old stuff. We could use some new inventions, maybe like solar panels invented in the 1890s or wind turbines late 1880s, maybe hydrogen invented in 1839, maybe batteries also 1839. I mean, we could use some new ideas. I think like all the, like hydrogen's hot, it's new, right? Well, have any of you read Phantom of the Opera? Like read the book, not just the musical. Have you read the book? You should read the book. Gaston Leroux wrote this. The French, where's Alex? The French were all over the city too. In Phantom of the Opera, he writes about the Paris Opera House using hydrogen blending with methane in the 1880s to change the brightness of the stage. Hydrogen blending, we talk about like, oh, that's a new idea. At NG, we did it in 2019. We're like, we're the world's first to blend hydrogen and gas. And you read Phantom of the Opera, like, well, I mean, other than this guy. He did. Jules Verne, another French author, wrote about this sort of the mysterious island. We're taking water to make hydrogen back to water. So hydrogen's not new, but although it's kind of cool, maybe we'll do more of it. But we could use some new ideas, I guess I'd say, a part of that. Anyway, this transition sets up for me, what's the question? The question is, how do we reduce impacts for us in America? And that raises sort of the question of the taxonomy of decarbonization. What's the priority order by which we should decarbonize? What are the things we should do? And in my mind, there's four steps. The first and most important step is efficiency. Whatever we don't consume makes it easier. Though We lower the height of the hurdle we have to clear if we just do efficiency. As a venture capitalist, I would tell you it's very hard to invest in efficiency. The business models for efficiency pretty much suck, but it's really important we need to do it. So that's why we tend to get there through policies and mandates and building codes and standards and that kind of thing. So efficiency is first. The second thing is electrification. Electrify as much as you can because the power sector is decarbonizing in parallel with the rise of cheap gas and wind and solar and geothermal, maybe nuclear and that kind of thing. So let's electrify as much as we can. Now, the good news is if you electrify, you also achieve the first one, which is efficiency because an electric heat pumps more efficient than a natural gas furnace. An electric car is more efficient than a gasoline engine. So my electric car, 90% efficient electric drivetrain. My other Ford, which now my son drives, has a gasoline drivetrain, 20% efficient. So even if I plug my 90% efficient electric drivetrain into a 35% efficient power plant, it's still more efficient than the gasoline engine. But I don't, I'll plug it into a natural gas combined cycle that Austin's running, which is more like 50% efficient. So we get efficiency from the electric drivetrain and the decarbonization, and I save money on the purchase price. My car was much cheaper than the gasoline equivalent, and I save $1,000 a year on energy and maintenance costs. It's incredible, it's a high performance car for less money, it's incredible. Well, maybe I'll come back to that because I think EVs have won and they're going to take over the market even faster 
than what most enthusiasts think. And I can come back to why I think that. Partly because I'm a driver of it. And I would never go back to a gasoline car because gasoline cars are so slow by comparison. But if we electrify, we gain efficiency as well. The third step is green molecules for the parts of the economy that are difficult, impractical, expensive, or impossible to electrify. A lot of things come to mind. Industrial heat, aviation, chemicals, marine shipping, heating in old buildings in cold climates. Molecules are really handy. Maybe heavy-duty trucking as well. And we need molecules for those things that are too difficult to electrify. Those green molecules might be hydrogen or ammonia, maybe biomethane, something like that. And then the fourth step is carbon management. Do direct air capture or point source carbon capture for the last step to remove the carbon from whatever the parts were you could not electrify nor use green molecules for. That's it. So efficiency, electrification, green molecules, carbon management. If we follow those four steps, and I think in that order, we'll decarbonize the economy. In fact, we're kind of doing that in the United States, whether we meant to or not. So that's the taxonomy of this. And it kind of gives me a lot of reason for optimism. And I'll close, uh, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, I think, with just a couple comments that everything I said about transition is going through acceleration right now. There are multiple accelerants for what's happening. The first accelerant is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The first hiccup of that was high natural gas prices, which brought coal back a little higher, but that was a hiccup. I actually think those high prices are accelerating, the, at least Europe's departure from imported gas. It's accelerating other things. So I think the Russian invasion making higher prices for conventional options, making the alternatives like renewables and nuclear and everything else look more co competitive is an accelerant. Washington, D.C. being policy relevant for the first time in a long time is an accelerant with the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Three different acts, very different processes, some bipartisan, some very partisan. But the policy is relevant for the first time, which is exciting. It reminds me of Winston Churchill, who said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted every other possible option. And he was talking about late entry into World War I and World War II. He says, Americans will come around to do the right thing, but man, they've got to flirt with everything else for a while. And that's the way we are with energy policy. We're last to the race, but when we're in, we're in to win. And we throw a lot of money at it like we did in World War I and World War II, and we will win. And now Europe and Japan and Australia are like, whoa, you guys leapfrog us on policy. At first, they're in disbelief, and then they're angry, and then they're scared. And so now you see EU and others in a policy race to pick up the pace because we're using it as industrial policy, mostly in rural Republican districts in the South, creating this battery belt and other things. But policy is an accelerant. And I, I, frankly, I think it's a policy that's going to stick because it's just too much money. People don't want to let go of the money. And then a third accelerant, and some of you are in here, is the students I get to teach are on this. Like, I, I've had the honor and privilege to teach thousands of students in person, plus tens of thousands online. And in the world of climate change and whether to take action or not, there is a huge generational divide. People older than me, not so sure we should take a change. People younger than me say, we got to get on it. And as the older people roll out of their leadership positions, younger people take them. Millennials are now in their 40s then they will be serious about this. And so if you're a company and you want to recruit the best and brightest, you better have an ESG plan. I'm looking at you, I help everyone get their ESG plans. You better have a climate plan, a net zero plan, because you won't be able to recruit and retain the best talent. And I think that'll be important. By the way, your customers want that anyway. And so these are all accelerants that give me a lot of optimism that we're on the way. So I'll, I'll make, it's Austin, so I want to say one controversial thing. In my head, I write op-eds, by the way. I write a lot of op-eds. Uh, and I write for the Statesman and the Chronicle and the New York Times and Scientific American and this kind of thing. And I was penning one in my head. And let me just test it on the Austin audience, see how it goes. The title of the op-ed in my head is How George W. Bush Saved Us from Climate Disaster. Quick reaction. Anyone? Be with us. Okay. You want me to tell you all the ways that he saved us? Okay. Governor Bush in 1999 did two important sort of compromise pieces of the same omnibus legislation to deregulate the Texas power market, which set our power market on a marginal price basis where the cheapest marginal kilowatt hour will win and the cheapest marginal kilowatt hours are wind and solar generally. So we set up a market that is really good for renewables and set up an RPS, a renewable portfolio standard, by some counts, the first mandate in America for renewables. Nevada might've had what's first, but we were, ours was before California and before the UK and other places. 
it was something called a compromise. I don't know if you know guys what that is, but a compromise is where Democrats and Republicans say, I want this and I want that. Oh, let's see if we can do both. And they work together. And Republican Governor George Bush working with the Democratic state legislature. The Democrats said we want renewables. Republicans said we want competitive markets. So we're like, okay, let's do both. I mean, this is kind of a deal, a political deal. And the Democrats thought the markets were silly, would were fail, and the Republicans thought the RPS was silly, would fail, and they were both wrong, both succeeded, although there were choppy things along the way. Let's not forget the price spikes and all that kind of stuff. But the market design of ERCOT is really good for renewables because it's on a marginal price basis. And the RPS was just enough to kickstart. The RPS was a requirement for two gigawatts of non-hydro renewables. We didn't know it would be wind, but wind was the winner. It could have been solar or geothermal or biomass. But a little bit of kickstart with a policy, with a favorable market, and it just took off in Texas. Now, Texas, I keep looking at Alex because I go to France. I give these speeches in France. Texas is bigger than France. And we got six times as much wind than you and a lot more solar. So we have, we have a lot of cheap, flat, windy, sunny land and a great favorable market and a little bit of policy that pushed it. So as governor, he did a lot to really help the energy transition with Texas leading the way. Running for president in 2000, you might not remember this, his policy platform on climate change was more aggressive than Al Gore's. People don't believe it. Now, he dropped it immediately when he was president, but he campaigned on mandatory, like, BTU fees and this kind of thing. And Al Gore was like, whoa, like, yeah, you don't be crazy. Let's be more, you know, voluntary or whatever. So Bush had a more aggressive climate stance than Al Gore when campaigning for 2000, dropped it entirely, kind of came back to it in 2008, barely, but not really, but rhetorically, he gave up on him. But he did two things as president, again, as compromises. The 2005 Energy Policy Act, EPEC 2005, had people call it the Halliburton exemption. Do you guys know what this is? Which kicked off the shale boom. And we look at what's happened to coal. Coal's dropped 60% since it peaked in the Bush administration for a variety of reasons, cheap gas being one of the very big ones. The other thing the Bush administration did in 2008 was tighten the mercury rules for coal, which killed new coal and killed a lot of old coal. And so if you add in the RPS, the ERCOT deregulation, Energy Policy Act 2005, kicking off the shell boom and the sort of mercury rules 2008, he saved us from climate disaster. Anyway, I'll write it and then you can write back about how that was crazy. I know a lot of politicians, the politicians will say, we often do all the right things for all the wrong reasons, but can't take credit for it because our base will kill us. And I don't know that's what he was doing. I haven't asked him, but those are very interesting. So that's the op-ed in my head that, you know, sometimes mysterious things happen and Texas leads the way despite it all and that kind of stuff. I had a quote in The Economist a couple months ago say, Texas often does all the right things for all the wrong reasons. That's basically who we are. Wait, why don't I stop there and then we'll take some Q&A. We got time, right? So we can keep rolling. Yeah, it's good. So thank you very much for listening. And I think we'll thank you. And you, you're asking, or Grace is I'm, I'm going to ask you three questions first, okay. but I'm going to remind the audience, now's your chance. We're starting Q&A a little bit earlier now, so if you were thinking about a question, you want to enter it in the Slack community now in the Energy, Climate, Sustainability channel. There are instructions on the website, austinforum.org. There's a menu item called Slack at the top. So if you've never added it before, just go read those instructions, and I'm going to ask three questions and uh, that'll give you plenty of time before we bring Grace up to ask the questions that she selected, including the winner. Right. So I wanted to ask you three, and one of them is related to a previous Austin Forum event. Andrew Grimshaw uh, spoke uh, from Lancium Energy, and they are harnessing wind power, the unused wind power that sometimes they have to spin down right. because of, I think it's called the Krebs line or Krebs, Krebs, Krebs yeah, line. Competitive Renewable Energy Zone, Krebs okay. lines, that's right. And so home. he explained that there's over 30 gigawatts of wind power potential generated in West Texas, but the Krebs line throttles it. And I want to say it was something like 16 gigawatts or something. Sounds about it's, right. That was a year ago. Yeah. So, so is there any work yeah. being done to address this congestion issue? Yeah, so great. So in Texas, we did a couple things. So another thing that was really Governor Perry's era, not Governor Bush's, was these CRES lines, Competitive Renewable Energy Zone lines. Another kumbaya bipartisan moment, by the way, where Democrats and Republicans said, let's do this. And Texas ultimately is pro-infrastructure. Let's build, so built a bunch of lines. And that helped enable the wind boom, in addition to the RPS and the competitive markets, and at the time, high gas prices that helped bring wind forward. So there are a variety of things that were happening. We built a bunch of lines. It costs billions of dollars. And in Texas, we are pick yourself up by your bootstrap capitalists, except when we're socialists. 
in one of the ways we're socialists is with transmission lines, where we amortize the costs across everybody. With postage stamp pricing, doesn't matter how far it goes, you pay the same, that's not exactly true, but it used to be true. And so we share the costs across everybody. We built a bunch of them and that was great, but we built more wind and solar and so the lines got full. Like a pipeline get full, the lines get full. So now we curtail a lot of wind or solar. We're still mm -hmm. curtailing it. We could use solar, we're curtailing it. So this curtailment because the congestion is a real problem. And so at various periods, we had 10% of the year with negative prices in West Texas, like where they would pay you to take the electricity. And we get that again as lines get congested. And so if you're Lancium, some of smart, you're like, well, I can use that for a data center, mm -hmm. or I can use that to do you know, crypto mining or something like that, or I can use it to do water treatment. There are a lot of things you can do in a flexible way. In the future, maybe we'll use excess wind and solar to make hydrogen or direct your capture. Or who knows? There's other things we can do that are high value. So using the spare wind and solar, and as we build more wind and solar, we'll have more times with spare electrons available. And converting those electrons into higher value dollars of some sort will be very useful. And Lansium's all over that. So they're, they're looking at that, and I think that's the opportunity. And so Texas, I would say, well, we should probably build more transmission lines. Congressman, Cazar, is it Caesar, Cesar? How do you pronounce it? Cesar, did anyone see his tweet today? He's putting forward legislation to build more transmission. So and, it is the Crest lines, they're, they're adding to it? Well, or the, well he's the put ability tweet, to reduce He congestion? has a tweet that says he wants legislation that might someday be legislation that might lead to real bill. So we're like eight, eight ifs away, but, but there's um, local Congress people working on this for Texas. Senator Markey's like, yeah, I'd love to do it. So even I'll just say people are like, it'd be good, good for the nation if Texas got its act together on transmission. So we could build more transmission, or we could find ways to use those electrons, or both in Lansium is more the latter. They're in the latter, right. Yeah. And so that's why I was asking. I, I think it's brilliant to move things out there that are energy intensive. Yeah. But if we need energy in a different part of the state, we still don't have the capability to move all of that. We here. should do so, both yeah, if we can. Both. And okay. we, a lot of the batteries are being built on the eastern side of the state because the lines are not as congested at night when you don't have solar, although it's still congested. Then they can store the electrons on this side. That was exactly my second oh, question of question. three. I beat you to it. Okay. Uh, the battery situation. So are we seeing any... Uh, large-scale advances in energy capacity, energy density in battery technology, or is it still this very brute force, got to build these gigantic batteries to store enough energy yeah. to not just power, you know, a neighborhood, but a city? Yeah, all, so yes, yes, and yes. So uh, some of you might know the name John Goodenough. Does that name mean anything to you, yeah. John? His name is John B. Goodenough. Like, his name is be good enough, right? <laughs> and uh, he uh, was a, he's a faculty colleague of mine until he died just a year ago. A mechanical engineering faculty member. We'd get lunch at the posse, the dive bar across from campus, and this kind of, he'd get a tostada and he'd go over there telling stories and stuff. And he changed the world by inventing RAM, uh, random access memory, and then changed the world again uh, with, the, uh, with the cathode of the lithium ion battery. He was and more than good enough. I he was say. more than good enough. Yeah. He, uh, it, the students would call him good and how, is what they would say. <laughs> which is a mispronunciation of his last name, but very funny nevertheless. And the lithium-ion battery has, well, you probably know it from your smartphones, the lithium-ion batteries today are lighter, but last longer, or are faster to charge, and that is happening mostly not through breakthroughs in the science, but just improvements in the manufacturing, the supply chain, the processes by which they're assembled, everything else. So we're just getting better at it because we've made so many millions of them or billions at this point. And so lithium-ion batteries get better every year at a sort of very steep rate, kind of like, Wind and solar have dropped 90 or 95% in the last decade or two. Lithium ion batteries are doing the same. So you're going farther on less weight on your electric car or going longer without charging your phone. And lithium ion batteries are really fast. They're getting really cheap, which is great. The knock on them is they don't last five days or two weeks or something. I don't remember the last time I went large, uh, longer without having to charge my iPhone, by the way. Yeah. I'm not sure I entirely agree well, with that. It's, it, we, they'd get better, but then we'd load them up. we load them up. Apps. Yeah. yeah, the apps are like Microsoft Outlook kills my battery. Like yeah. It's always running in the background, that kind of thing. So we're seeing so, incremental improvement in it, but there's yeah. is there anything that looks to be on the horizon? Has anything appeared in yes. Nature or Science Journal that looks like a revolutionary step forward, a 2X, a 5X, a 10X? Yes, especially if you believe the headlines, which I might or might not believe, but... There's different chemistries. Um, we know we have lead acid batteries in our old cars. There's many different types of batteries and different kind of chemistries. And lead acid lasts a while, but it's really heavy. And lithium ion's light, but doesn't last as long. Lithium ion's very quick. But there's also iron air batteries that form energy is making, these long duration energy storage batteries that last four days and have high capacity. But they're not made to do fast cycling. You'll use them for those multi-day periods where it's neither windy nor sunny, which we have in Texas. And Europe has it for like two weeks at a time. California will have multiple five, seven, or nine-day stretches in a year like that. So longer duration, different chemistries. 
John Goodenough, before he died, was working on making silicon batteries or sulfur and other more common material batteries that would be certainly cheaper because it's more abundant material, but more thermally stable so you wouldn't get the thermal runaway. And thermal runaway is a polite word for fire. <laughs> and so you have a safer battery. And he's like, I'm working on it. But then he died. He didn't quite finish. We're like, can you kind of come, come back and just tell us a few more things? So there's other chemistries. I'm not sure they're breakthroughs, but they're getting better. Toyota just announced a month ago they've got a new battery design that's half the weight and twice the distance. Uh, a lot of people are skeptical. We'll see how that goes. But uh, battery technology gets better. It's mostly not scientific breakthrough, although there are some pretty important scientific advances. It's mostly our manufacturing process. So if I look at solar panels, solar panels today are much cheaper than they were a decade ago, but the efficiency is basically the same. They just got a lot better at the manufacturing. Yeah. And the supply chain drove down the cost of the key ingredients. So that's, that's the bigger story in batteries, actually. But I think there's room for more on that. Yeah, one of the things I'm hoping for, and it's actually the topic of Tuesday night's event, is quantum computing. Oh. Um, we all think of quantum computing for decrypting things and optimization problems. But it was actually first postulated yeah. for quantum uh, physical structure of nature yeah. kinds of problems. And it turns out with the classical HPC system, you can't even simulate all of the quantum states of a caffeine molecule. So everything we're doing is an approximation, and there's yeah. some belief and some people that, that a quantum computing system may be able to solve the quantum molecular chemistry at a level that helps us produce more energy. Uh, yeah, we keep getting like nano, we keep, you know, yeah. keep getting smaller, smaller nano, like that's where we design membranes, be more efficient, everything yeah. else. But actually, we got to get smaller than nano. That's not small enough. We got to get down, not just the atomic level, but the quantum state within it, whether it's spin up or spin down and this kind of thing. So right. we're going to get deep. Sorry, uh, we'll do the new. Come Tuesday later. night and Worley yeah. will talk about quantum computing. Yeah. And that will be one of the things I'm going to make sure he talks about yeah. before then. Uh, last question I have before I turn it over to our moderator for the, the questions from the audience is, what about nuclear? Uh, yeah, so uh, in Austin, you always get the N-word, nuclear. And it's Austin, so it's always like, we hate it, or why don't we have more of it, right? There's no middle ground, which is actually typical of American opinion. If you, uh, if you watch movies, I, wa I teach a class this semester called Energy of the Movies. It's for liberal arts honor students, and only liberal arts can you get away with that, by can the way. Can we audit that? Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a, if any of you know Plan 2, it's a Plan 2 class, and we watch energy movies, and we talk about it. Now, it's like, this is a great class. And yesterday, we watched Tulsa from 1949, a great oil movie, if you know that, with Joe Wills and others and Clark Gable. But uh, we also watch nuclear movies. And in movies about nuclear, nuclear either will kill us all or make us a superhero with time travel. That's or it. Or make Godzilla. Or make Godzilla. Yeah. yeah, so it's like end of the world, it, but also makes you Spider-Man or yeah. Iron Man yeah. or Back to the Future. So it's, it's really good or really bad. There's no middle ground. That is actually an honest reflection of American sentiment, especially Austin sentiment. And I would say that as an engineer, I look at nuclear as clean, safe, dispatchable power. Most engineers look at nuclear that way. It's got supreme energy density. A kilogram of the uranium you need is 20,000 times more energy dense than a kilogram of coal. It's just, it just the energy density is phenomenal. So that means less extraction from the earth and the waste materials are entirely captured. Now the waste is nasty, but you capture it all and there's far less of it than say the waste from burning CO2. So I am a nuclear fan. And I would say, I keep coming back to France because I know well in France, which is more of a technocracy than America, America will run more by lawyers and lawyers look at nuclear as a liability waiting to happen. Engineers look at it as a controllable process. And so France, 75% of the electricity comes from nuclear and has really great performance and low cost, although struggling right now with drought and a few other things. So I, I tend to be pro-nuclear. Me too. However, if you look at the story of nuclear around the world, it has been operating on an ethic of 60 years of bigger is better because that's how you get economies of scale. And I think that we're flipping it right now, which is smaller and modular is better. Because the problem you have with American nuclear, in contrast to France, so France has... 45 or so reactors. We have about 95. In France, they're all the same reactors, they're the same design. And the joke goes like this, that in America, we have 100 types of nuclear reactors, but one type of cheese. And in France, it's the other way around. One type of reactor <laughs> and 100 cheeses. And by having the same design, it's like Southwest Airlines. Every pilot can fly every plane. Every mechanic can work on every plane. Southwest Airlines, you get efficiency. The French fleet is much more efficient. Ours are all custom stick built on site. That drives the costs up. The reason why we can get these significant price drops in wind or solar or batteries is because we make so many of them. And if you make millions of something, you get better at it, price comes down. Now, I don't think we'll make millions of small modular reactors, but if you make a small modular reactor instead of custom stick built on site, but in a factory, and you make, I don't know, 20 at a time, 
your costs will come down because you have higher control. Then you can move it just by train or truck to site. You don't do custom stick build. So as we go modular and smaller, I think prices come down. And as we get more serious about carbon, probably we won't care if the prices come down because we'll put a price on carbon for the others or something like that. So I, I, suspect, I suspect nuclear will hang in there in America. We have large nuclear retiring. I bet we'll put new nuclear in place at about the pace we retire it. I, nuclear is about 20% of our power mix today in America. I hope it stays there. I wouldn't mind if it goes up. I don't want it to go down. That's sort of I, I didn't realize it was 20%. I thought 20%. it was like more than 10. Great. It's like 8% of energy of all purposes, but of the power sector. Of infrastructure. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Uh, and with that, we are now going to take questions from the audience. First, I want to introduce, if I get closer to the, okay. If you get real close, apparently. Press the button. Okay, it's a little stuck, but I want to introduce Aren't Grace Shea. Grace Shea, she's an energy analyst in the Energy Management and Strategic Programs Group at the University of Texas at Austin, and colleagues with Dr. Michael Weber. She is going to lead us through the audience Q&A. Please welcome Grace. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have a lot of questions. Okay. Michael. Um, so I'll just get right to it. Uh, first question I have is, um, so with the global application and hype behind AI, how can AI in its subset play a part in accelerating the interconnection process in order to advance the sustainable goals. That's great. So artificial intelligence and machine learning and other advanced data science techniques are on the rise, and they are electricity intensive, which means the rise of data centers and that kind of thing. So the first impact of AI on the energy system will be increasing demand, significantly increasing demand. By some estimates from Energyville, which is a think tank in eastern Belgium, they think AI will consume more energy than Belgium does by 2024 or five. I mean, like in a year or two, the, the pace of increase in growth is so significant. And so that's a strain on the system. Now, these growth trajectories are often wrong. They said the same thing about data centers for Google search, like I said, but the data centers become more efficient, so it levels off. And so maybe AI won't grow like this. Maybe it'll level off at some point or slow the rate of growth. We'll see. But AI is firstly a strain on the system, but perhaps we can use its sophisticated techniques to make better decision-making faster. And I guess in that case, it's like transmission expansion or siting. We have all these fights about where to put stuff and how to do it. Maybe that will facilitate better decision-making. When the internet came to life, we said, now we got access to all the information in the world, we'll make better decisions. That isn't obvious that that happened, but perhaps we can be optimistic that we'll have this guidance from artificial intelligence to streamline certain procedures. Uh, the jury's out. Frankly, I'm more skeptical, I guess. I think there are a lot of things that artificial intelligence can do, uh, and I'm pretty excited about it. I'm also kind of scared about it, because the thing about artificial intelligence, like some of my high school classmates, is it will lie without knowing it. And it will, it will say things that are wrong. It doesn't know it's wrong sometimes. And you can ask, like if you go to chat GPT, um, you know, what's public opinion on whatever? It'll create a Pew research poll that's false. To give you, I mean, it looks very convincing, but it's completely wrong. So that kind of freaks me out. However, artificial intelligence is really powerful at synthesizing and summarizing. It's great at code. So you want to write it, give me a Python script to open a file, scrape the data, and format it. AI will be great at that. So I see ways our artificial intelligence will be great efficiency enhancers and great risk for society. And I don't know which side it works out. But if it yields great efficiencies, we'll do more of it, which means more energy intensity. But maybe it lets us build things faster. So that's my long way of saying I've got no idea. But I, I think... Our permitting and expansion and transmission siting and other things, we're so bad at it, it can't make it worse, right? Uh, hopefully it'd make it better. But I, I think in the end we'd have, a, yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, it's like, we'll see how it goes. Um, but I think, um, let's hope for the best on this. That's, that's my long non-answer for okay. you on that. Great question. Okay. So uh, Michael asks, the UN forecasts that by 2100, the world's population will decrease to about 6 billion people. What does this do to our need for energy? Given that every else I see, it will increase despite this decline. So I've not seen a UN population decline forecast. And so I wonder, it's level, I've seen leveling. I will say that in this century, for the first time in human history, there will be a day where the population is the same as it was the day before. 
that is unique except for brief moments when there is like the black plague and that kind of thing so we will have a leveling in a sustained way and this is unprecedented in human history to our knowledge and that will change a lot of our theories of societal governance and everything. I mean, we got we have so much of our philosophies around growth, growing the economy. How do you grow if you don't have population growth? That will happen. I don't know if it's going to decline. I suspect it'll level. And you could say it's going to happen 2050, maybe 2100, but probably this century it happens. And that is pretty interesting. And we don't know what that's going to mean. But from an energy perspective, it means the accelerating consumption of resources probably slows down unless our wealth keeps going. But interestingly, you, as you get wealthier, you use more until you start to use less. You, you use more energy to get rich, but then you start to use that energy to build an efficiency. So I, I'm actually thinking the population leveling will be fine from an energy perspective. But I do worry about things like capitalism as an operating philosophy relies on growth. We don't have a degrowth capitalism. But look at the struggles Japan and Russia have with shrinking populations. It's hard especially if you have a shrinking population where you have an, a growing older population and fewer younger people to pay for the older people, things get really upside down. So I'm more worried about that. The inter, I think from a resource perspective, actually that'll be a relief in some ways that the population will level. Um, but the great question, and I would say that how we use energy might drive when and how that peak happens. Will be 2050 or 2100. Uh, our energy system might help drive the timing of that. That's a great question. Thanks. Um... We have a geothermal question. A geothermal question. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Uh, what is your perspective on hot rock geothermal energy based on oil and fracking technology? I love it. So, uh, so question about geothermal. I'm a huge fan of geothermal. So, I do a lot of. De I hate debate. I'm not a debater, but I do debates, which is where, like, why am I debating with people? I'm not a debater. But, um, but I'll do these debates. People say you can't run an economy on renewables. Because wind and solar aren't reliable. I'm like, okay, you're leaving out hydro and geothermal and bioenergy. And like, there's a lot of other forms of renewable other than wind and solar. And geothermal in particular is interesting because its availability doesn't depend on astronomical or meteorological conditions. So it doesn't depend on the clouds or position of the earth relative to the sun. So that 24-7 reliability is really interesting. It's, universe, it's everywhere. We all have it. It's just a matter how far we got to drill. Some places it's closer, like in... Uh, sort of northern Italy and also in Nevada and California. There are places where it's like spilling out of the ground. Uh, and it's like Iceland. I went there two years ago in Iceland. I was at the geysers. I was at the site. In Iceland's 100% renewables for their electricity between hydro and geothermal. By the way, Norway is 98% renewables with hydro for the power sector, at least. And so geothermal is very exciting because its performance profile is very different than wind and solar and a suitable complement in a variety of ways and low carbon, although some geothermal sites have a lot of CO2 that gets released. So you have to be mindful of that. And we can use this incredible expertise we've built up for oil and gas over 150 years these days with hydraulic fracturing or other ways to stimulate the wells and extract the heat. I mean, oil and gas have been drilling for oil and gas and finding heat by accident. Why not drill for heat and find oil and gas by accident? And so I think we could do that. And Fervo is one technology startup that is using hydraulic fracturing techniques and has PPAs, these power purchasing agreements, to actually deliver geothermal energy. They are breaking ground, they are building, they're in production, their test wells work. And that's, uh, and Tim Latimer, the CEO, is a good friend, based in Houston, but they're operating mostly in like Nevada and California, using that technique. Like we got great drilling techniques, we've got great well completion techniques, let's get the heat and make 24 seven CO2 free power. It's great. Now it's not as cheap as wind and solar, but it has a different performance as well. Like uh, you, we don't need more of the cheap stuff necessarily, although we could use more. Uh, we need more of the dispatchable power here and there, depending on what your grid mix is. So I'm very excited about geothermal. Now, there are many other startups. There's uh, Ever and others and Sage that are doing closed-loop systems. They go down, they draw all the way across and up, like it's all one closed-loop system. Uh, there are people doing enhanced geothermal with actually putting water down there on purpose. So there's a variety of techniques for geothermal. We'll see what the markets decide as a winner. Probably there will be several technologies that win. And I think time is right. Uh, now, it will help if... We had a price on carbon or if other options were more expensive because geothermal looks pricey still but utilities are signing up because they want the power from it um the pareto principle states that 80 percent of outcomes come from 20 percent of causes what is the 20 percent cause that the average texan can address in their personal life today to affect 80 percent of the outcome to move texas towards a more energy sustainable future. 
the two biggest footprints, if we want to use that word, for people in America in general, for their emissions, if we're talking about CO2 emissions in particular, are the electricity they consume and the gasoline they consume, and within electricity, particularly the coal that's consumed. And so for the United States forever, until like two or three years ago, the power sector was the biggest emitter nationwide, followed by transportation. However, we've shut down 60% of our coal, ramped up on wind and gas and solar. So our emissions in the power sector have dropped so dramatically in the last few years that as a sector, it's lower than transportation, which is dominated by gasoline, but also some diesel and aviation fuel. And so for us, using less electricity or using cleaner electricity will reduce the biggest, one of the biggest parts of our footprint. And that is true at the national level, but also the individual level. The second thing we could do is drive on gasoline less, which might be you drive an electric vehicle or you don't drive. You work from home a couple of days a week or you live closer to work or you do uh, micro mobility, e-scooters or biking or walking or something else. There are other ways to move other than driving a four and a half thousand pound gasoline vehicle to move 225 pounds to work. So there's other ways we can go about, like I'm a small fraction of the car's weight, uh, despite how big I am, I'm still a small fraction. And so work from home and COVID was actually a great CO2 emissions policy because it got us out of the cars. Now it got us onto electricity and less efficient electricity at home than at work, but it shifted things. The rise of electric vehicles will help. And I think the other part of electricity is air conditioning in Texas, or maybe heating, depending on where you are. A smaller home, closer to work, is probably the way to go. And that's urban density, that's walkable neighborhoods, that's thinking about our work-life patterns. And I think work from home is one of the biggest things from COVID that doesn't snap back. There are a variety of things that, after you know, COVID, COVID didn't end, right? I had a few weeks ago, but there's a lot of people like return to normal and a lot of things, but there's one thing that people won't return to normal is in the office, eight hours a day, five days a week. Like I think that's forever changed uh, for a lot of people and a lot of places are just three or four days or never going in or that kind of thing. So those are the things we think about as how big is my home that America has seen and how close is it to work? It's kind of the way I think about it. Okay. So let me go to, okay. So you mentioned we need innovation in the top four highest consumers of carbon fuels, internal combustion engines, uh, or I'm sorry. So the highest combustion uh, consumer of combustion fuels such as internal combustion engines. As, as a professor of mechanical engineering and a venture investor, how do you recommend we go about designing and developing more efficient engines? That is great. So engines is a big part of mechanical engineering, and I teach thermodynamics. So we talk about engines. We might not need as many engines, which relies on heat to push a piston or to spin a blade or something like that. I think we're going to need a lot less of that, although I think we need some. So it's, uh, I think it's hard to get rid of all engines. But we can make the engines more efficient in a variety of ways. Um, the one way to get there is with higher burn temperatures. What you burn can be burned at different temperatures. The fuel matter, hydrogen burns at a higher temperature, so maybe you get more efficiency. You can also think about burning at higher pressures to reduce the pollutants that might form. And so there are companies looking at a higher temperature, higher pressure combustion, which requires special alloys or metals or things like that. And then you can get more efficiency and fewer pollutants along the way. And then you can think about all the other parts of the drivetrain, all the connections and that kind of thing. But at some point, there's only so much you can do thermodynamically to get more efficiency out of a heat engine. And so I, I think we can get better. My gasoline engine is 20% efficient. Certainly, we can do better than that. Turbines in combined cycle operation are more like 50 or 60%. So there's more we can do, but that's not where the money's going. If you look at the R&D money, it's not for better combustion for the most part. I, uh, as when I was at NG and I'm running our research group at NG, we would meet with the research groups at Shell and Volkswagen and Siemens, you name it. And I would go meet with their chief technology officer. And I was meeting with uh, the head of the combustion research group of Volkswagen. He's like, there's two of us left. Not two heads, like two researchers in combustion engines because Volkswagen was all in on electric. So we can improve combustion. There's more we can do with additives and materials and other things, but the money is not flowing there. The money is going to better electric motors or other systems. And I think that has basically determined the future. So I, I made this comment that I think EVs have won. And I'll tell you, EVs have won because they're cheaper, they're quieter, they're faster, they're higher performing. The only place they really underperform is on long road trips at the charging time. I bet that's solved in three or four years. I think that's almost solved. 
and, and besides people have to stop every 200 miles anyway to go to Bucky's or whatever. So I think that's all. But the more important reason, so my, my it's, pardon me for talking numbers, it's rude to talk about dollars. My, I splurged my Mustang, my Mach-E Mustang cost me $65,000. The Shelby Cobra Mustang is $80,000, but mine is faster. I got a higher performing Mustang for $15,000 less. And I save $1,000 a year on energy and maintenance costs. I got a better car for cheaper, except on road trips which I do a few times a year, and that's an issue, and I have to think about it. That's solved in a few years. But the more important reason why I think EVs are one is not just because they're better cars that are cheaper. By the way, not everyone's going to get a $65,000 car, but GM and Volkswagen now have the $35,000 version, which is the average sticker price for cars in America today. And then there are more options coming later. There's some fewer parts. There's so much cheaper and easier to make. The margins will go up. They're not there yet, but they will be. But the more important thing is if you look at what GM and Ford and Volkswagen have said, they have said, we will not sell you combustion cars after 2035. That's it. And they said that in 2021, two years ago. Why do they say that? Because a model lifetime is seven years. That's two model lifetimes from 2021 to 2035. They're not going to make them. If you want to buy a combustion engine, you're not going to get it, except for some specialty off-road vehicles here and there. But even those are probably going to electrify sooner. So if you believe the CEOs of the car companies are like, that's all we're going to sell you. So they're not investing in the combustion R&D. If you don't believe them, you should listen to the CEO of ExxonMobil, Darren Woods, who last year, almost a year ago uh, to the day, said on the record, he believes, and ExxonMobil believes, 100% of all light-duty vehicles sold in the world in 2040 will be electric. The people making the cars have said, we're only selling the electric. The people selling the gasoline says, we think there's only going to be electric. He says, I don't care. Those electric cars need lightweight materials like plastics. We sell plastics. He's okay with it. Fascinating. So I think though we can improve combustion, which is a great question, I'm not sure we will just because that's not where the money's flowing. But as a guy who got a PhD in combustion, I'm kind of like, I want to say we should burn more stuff, but I'm kind of fond of it. Like I have a nostalgia for burning stuff in the lab and that kind of thing. So it's too bad. Like it's old school stuff. We need more Bucky's. <laughs> Bucky's is adding chargers and solar panels to be emergency evacuation for hurricanes and stuff too. So, uh, Bucky, okay. Let me, let me talk about Bucky's because I invest in business. I think about intellectual property moats are a way to protect your company with a moat of intellectual property so you can own a space of a supply chain or whatever it is for your startup. Bucky's has zero intellectual property moat. Anybody can do what they're doing. Why haven't other people done it? There's starting to be some other ones pop up. You need tens of millions of dollars to add 128 gasoline pumps and 4,000 urinals and like a lot of fountain drink. Like, but that's not, it's just money, right? Someone, and, and there's so many places like between here and Amarillo where we need a Bucky's. Anyway, so I urge all of you enterprising business people <laughs> to please improve American road trips by coming up with a competitor. I, this is one like, this is such an obvious money maker with zero way for them to stop you from doing it. I don't know why other people haven't done that. And this is sort of on my mind because I had a conversation. I was brought in to one of the biggest oil and gas companies in America, whose name you'd recognize, but I shouldn't say, in June. And I did a briefing for their top 600 leaders. And they asked, like, you know, about the future of energy, what's going on? And they kind of did a final question. What's the one thing we got wrong? I'm like, okay, well, let me pick. But <laughs> I said, your predictions on the future of gasoline consumption are so deeply wrong you need to get ready for that because gasoline consumption peaked in America in 2018. They're peaking in China like this month. According to the Chinese oil company, Sinopec, they're like, it's peaking now. And when the two world largest gasoline consumers say gasoline consumption has peaked or is peaking now, gasoline consumption is about to go off a cliff. And if you are a BP, Chevron, Shell, ExxonMobil, you name it, and 45% of your barrel is gasoline, and a non-trivial fraction of your revenues are your gasoline stations, that are already losing market share to Bucky's because Bucky's has cleaner bathrooms. And now you're going to lose the gasoline hook. It's going to, it's going to transform business models. And I said, you're wrong. like, it's, they show it kind of leveling. Right? Like, it's going to go like this. How many people buy a landline for their phone anymore? Right. How many people go buy a cathode ray, ray tube monitor? You don't do it. Right. You do think, well, you might have a specialized need to do. So um, not everyone's like you. So, but most people will buy the flat panel display. So the CRT, but the, um, and so I think Bucky's is sort of interesting that 
there should be more of them. And Bucky's like, okay, how do we add fast chargers? How do we add other things? Because they need you to stop for gasoline so they can get you to buy beaver nuggets in a $400 smoker. And so this stop will be interesting. But if you're stopping for charging, you're there 10 minutes instead of five minutes, you'll spend more money. Anyway, I, I went on a long rant, but I encourage you all to launch that business and ask me to invest. <laughs> Hey, I, I was given the uh, signal that, that sign I thing? have okay. one question left. And, and, and Jay's probably like, can you make your answer shorter? Is, guy, <laughs> is that what you're saying also? Bucky's to charge. So I, I love that. Story. You love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I notice all the Bucky's are about one large fountain drink apart. So that, they, they yeah. know they've done the math. Yeah. What is the bladder distance? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which changes by decade and age for us, maybe. Okay. Um, so do we have Lala Ilan or Ilonza? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I just mispronounced your last name. How do you pronounce it? Elizondo. Okay, so um, I picked your question as the winner for the All right. by badge. Oh, the winner. So, <laughs> um, so the question is, what are the most critical policy changes needed to create a more integrated and efficient approach to managing energy and water resources globally? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, if so, how do we? What's the if we've got one policy lever? What's the one policy lever we should do? And I would say, if I were king of the world, I would put a price on pollution. Just you can't pollute for free anymore, which is the way we do it now. And if you put a price on pollution, it makes the dirty stuff more expensive. We'll quit doing it because we might not care about pollution, but we're cheap, especially in America. So I say, put a price on pollution. And this is important because I mentioned these debates I do. And people are like, well, when are you going to end subsidies? And then how will renewables do then? I'm like, well, when you end the subsidies, renewables do better because the subsidies are primarily the free pollution for people who are burning right now and don't have to pay for it. That's the thing we waive as a society that we should no longer waive, that we should put a fee on. And I think that would solve it. And like 99% of economists say that's the most efficient way to decarbonize the economy. I do want to know who the 1% of the economists are who don't like that. Like there's like three out of four dentists recommend Trident. Like, okay, who's that fourth dentist? But I was like, so anyway, but this is the thing, this is the most efficient way to do it. It's the, it's the most obvious from a, if we were magic, what would we do? That doesn't mean it's politically easy or will happen anytime soon, but that's what I would do. Great question. Market driven, absolutely, yeah. Put a price signal on it. Well, thank you very much. All right, let's give a round of applause to Michael and Grace.